So I've been studying popularity. Essentially, it has to do with the demand for assets, and particularly, I look at the stock market. Uh, it's, a, it's a really simple idea. It's, it has to do with our preferences. We find certain types of securities more popular than others. The securities that we find popular, we have more demand for, and they're going to be higher priced. And when they're higher priced, what that means is relative to the same cash flows, they're going to have lower returns. So ultimately, uh, what we actually like to buy, actually, if we really want higher returns, is the less popular securities. So this is a little bit counterintuitive, of course. People think they want to buy what everybody else is really buying. But those are the ones that have a lot of demand. And in fact, if you buy the overlooked stocks, those are the stocks that have less demand, are lower priced, but ultimately have higher returns. So, so I, in this uh, presentation, I actually talked about the bridge between classical and behavioral finance. In classical finance, uh, essentially there are three aspects of it, which is that everybody, we presume that there's rationality, that investors are rational. And, and uh, then we have to have an equilibrium, or sometimes we could have arbitrage pricing, arbitrage. Now, in, in the way I've been talking about it here, though, it's really equilibrium because uh, it's actually very difficult to make a, a lot of these arbitrages. So the preferences that the market has for one thing or another cannot easily be moved, removed by arbitrage. In, in fact, these preferences uh, are going to show up in security prices. So in classical finance, uh, the, uh, the way we would define it typically is rationality, that investors are rational. It would also, we could either choose for between arbitrage pricing or equilibrium, but I'm actually arguing here that equilibrium is a better explainer of, of stock market prices and asset, market, asset prices. Arbitrage would be great for derivatives and so forth. But in asset pricing, uh, equilibrium is the, is the better way to explain things. So ultimately, with rationality, you get efficient markets. And so that's a, a great way to describe the world. And, and ultimately, though, it doesn't have to only look at risk, because risk is only one of the things that you are rationally do not like. We like, for example, we want more liquidity, or we want tax efficiency. These are very rational things to care about. And these and various, some securities are more tax efficient than others, and some securities are more liquid than others. And all of these things will be priced in a capital asset pricing model that, in, that incorporates the preferences of a rational person. So it, and, and in contrast, we have behavioral finance. And behavioral finance, we have, people have uh, preferences that might not be considered rational in the context of getting the best returns relative to, to their risk or liquidity. Uh, they're, they're not strictly oriented toward the returns. That, in, for example, one big topic at, at the uh, conference here, the World Investment Forum, is ESG, environmental social governance. If we care a lot about that, that's going to affect our demand for certain types of securities. And when you have a lot of demand for the securities, it's going to raise their prices and ultimately lower, lower returns. So that's, that's behavioral. It's not uh, risk return, but it definitely impacts pricing. Um, not all behavioral things, though, are sort of, we know in advance, we, get, we, we can actually make a lot of errors in our behavioral work, too, because there's so many different cognitive mistakes are made. And those kind of mistakes also get into the pricing. They, they can, if they're permanent mistakes, like we, in, in growth stocks, we might always extrapolate and always think that they're going to continue growing at a fast rate, and we may pay way too much for growth stocks causing a value premium, so that value actually has higher returns. But it can also mean th that uh, uh, just generally mispricing, so there might be temporary behavioral effects. All of these, though, are, again, it gets back to popularity, because if certain stocks are popular for whatever reason, that reason might be that, that they have a, a classical reasons that might be purely rational. They might be irrational. For all these reasons, though, preferences affect prices. And ultimately, we can describe that in 
One word here, popularity. Since preferences are both rational and irrational, um, often they can be permanent or temporary, uh, uh, popularity includes really everything here. So uh, when we look at this popularity perspective, it in includes rational approaches, the classical finance, and it includes the behavioral approaches that we find in behavioral finance. So the nice thing about popularity is it, it provides a bridge between behavioral finance and, and uh, classical finance. And this is really important because these two sides of the coin have been really disputing everything in the past. And now we're saying they're really looking at the same thing. They're really just looking at preferences. And it's just a matter of uh, what type of preferences we're looking at. So popularity uh, explains a lot of the existing premiums in the market and can be used to explain the existing mispricing. But you know, if you actually think of it as make it into a testable hypothesis, you want to look at for the sort of things that the other theories are not necessarily picking up on. And so we just did some quick tests on, on branding and reputation and and um, moats of companies. And it, it turns out that all of our preliminary tests actually show that, that it's the less popular stocks that actually have the higher returns. So you think you want the companies with high reputations, but in fact the companies with low reputations actually have, have higher returns. So as far as what we're going to do, we've got lots of things to test. There's a whole myriad of ways of, of looking at markets now and all the different ways we can we can test, uh, test the markets. So uh, in, in terms of in investment management, uh, if you use popularity as how, how you're picking stocks, it's something that is a, it potentially can be an effective way to actually manage money. Because uh, what's popular is always changing. And of course, you may, we actually may want to short the popular hot stocks and actually take long positions in, in the kind of stocks that are less popular. And as those hot stocks cool down, you end up benefiting, because as they cool down, their prices drop. And as the, the overlooked stocks get recognized, they come up in value. And, and so uh, learning about the, dyna the dynamic aspects of popularity actually has some great potential for looking at returns. Mm -hmm.